स्वस्तिर्भवतु शातिर्भवतु पूर्ण मंगल शाति 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 So we are in this uh, chapter number three and moving into the chapter number four soon. And these are in the middle, uh, chapter 11, 12 and 13, and all are dedicated to the sacrifice. And some of you may have read those chapters. And, and once we understand that principle or the concept or the vision of the sacrifice, everything else falls into its right place. Everything. Integral yoga, each mantra, even this mantra which I was just chanting now, may all be happy, may all find fullness and fulfillment. Because we all depend on each other. The whole world depends on the happiness of one another. Um, because only in that moment the discovery of the divine values can take place. And the divine is within us, all of us, and has to be revealed. And that is happiness of all. You know, it doesn't mean that my neighbor has to be happy <laughs> of me being unhappy, because only then he will be happy. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. It means may my neighbor discover the divine values in himself you know? and me also and then only we find something which is which makes sense for the manifestation of this world um, so we are on uh, ending the chapter 12 the significance of the sacrifice and moving into the chapter 13 the Lord of the Sacrifice, and it will be the last chapter in the series on the sacrifice. Um, there, there is a beautiful article written by Siegfried on the sacrifice, very subjective, uh, very deep and profound, uh, and nearly tangible. One could feel and see the uh, the way of looking at inner reality from within how things are connected and why they are the way they are. Uh, it's beautiful. I myself have uh, very similar experiences, um, especially in this time of COVID, when you have to look within, you have your time to look within and try to find meaning in everything what is happening to us. Um, So, um, of course, Mother explains sacrifice in a very interesting way. Sri Aurobindo also in other places, not only in the essays on the Gita. And she says that the sacrifice was done by the divine. And that is the, the secret part of the sacrifice which we do not see, that the divine gave itself to us as those who are rising or evolving out of the darkness, as an example of how we should find a way back to the divine. So by self-giving and by increasing the, the light within us, there is the way to come back to a full awareness of our inner, uh, inner selves. And because our outer selves, our unconscious being, does not know how to do it. So it needs an example. It needs someone to show it how to do it, how to give itself to the divine, how to offer unregenerated, darkened, narrowed down being in us and consciousness to the vast and more luminous presence within us. Uh, 
So that is the, the example which is answered gradually with the help of psychic being within us, as beautifully it is described by Siegfried, uh, that agent within us, Yajamana, who is conducting that particular um, process of offering everything which it can reach to. It can touch all our um, unconscious existence because it is involved here and can bring it back to its self-awareness gradually by offering it to the higher light within us. Um, so this is the double way of sacrifice. Yeah? The divine gives itself to us to teach us and to give us the guidance how we can offer everything what we have and are to the divine back and thus by this double process of giving oneself to the higher uh, consciousness in us we are evolving in consciousness hmm. you know i would just uh, a comment on on something interesting there which is uh, this notion that the uh, yagya, the sacrifice, is actually happening at the cosmic or the universal level. And mm -hmm. it is, if you will, this cosmic law, right? Because the divine did sacrifice himself, did perform yagya. And so it's an inherent law within the universe. And, and everyone, whether consciously or unconsciously, are therefore following this law and sacrificing and therefore we have as you said evolution and progress and the, the difference which is what i was wondering between sacrifice and surrender is sur surrender is when we do it consciously once we do conscious yagya where we surrender knowingly to ourselves and we're actually can uh, push the evolutionary progress forward, um, assist nature in, in moving uh, ahead faster. So it was, I was thinking of this, this uh, phrase that we often use at La Grasse, you know, that all life is yoga. And, and the quote is really more, all life is yoga, whether, whether done consciously or unconsciously. So unconsciously is the sacrifice that we're all involved with, the trees, the animals, earth, us, and consciously is when we actually awaken and surrender our entire uh, being to the divine. And, and like I said, then, then you get the, the progress um, or your support of nature in this evolutionary mm. process. So I thought that was a really nice way that one's cosmic and one's individual. Very nice, very nice, that beautiful. That mm. Yes, once we become aware individually about the divine presence in us, we can do it consciously, as we call it, you know, with a, a conscious will, as it were, aware of what is going on already in, in life. By the way, here is this kind of support for, for your thought. Sacrifice is the law of the world and nothing can be gained without it. Nothing can be gained without it. Neither mastery here, nor the possession of heavens beyond, nor the supreme possession of all. This world is not for him who does not sacrifice. How then any other world? This quotation from the Gita. So what is interesting that this is the law of the world, only we do not see it immediately. We think that we are here in the midst of all these attacks and we have to survive and we have to protect ourselves and we are struggling constantly with everyone moving around us. But everyone moves around us and gives himself in one way or another, consciously or unconsciously, resistingly or willingly, <laughs> to each other. We are reaching out. There is a very beautiful article, or oh, the book by Amal Kiran, Light and Delight, it is called. And uh, there he explains this, uh, the, the sacrifice, the, the vision of love, as Mother describes. She says that if we, we are made in such a way in, in that we are all perfect selves. And if we would not have that drive within us, uh, 
the drive of love, of self-giving, the world would never evolve, never developed. So we would stay constantly in this perfect self, as it were. We don't need anybody. But there is something in us which is pushing us to, to find relations with others. <laughs> and that is the power of love. Of course, when it is misunderstood, when it is um, narrowed down by unconscious, it becomes power of hate, of, of concern, of fear, and so on and so forth. But it is still the power which is reaching out to find oneself in others, and others in oneself. So it is a constant movement which generates the, the, the movement in the world as a sacrifice. And the world lives on this. Without it, there would be no world. So it's absolutely true. Uh, so we stopped somewhere in the... If you want to, if you have some thoughts or would like to share th some thoughts, please, it's a good place. Vladimir, I have just one thought in my mind. Sri Aurobindo has written about it as well as in Gita, uh, Krishna, Sri Krishna is saying that the approach to the divine should follow swadharma. What does that mean? Swadharma means what? Um, well, it's a specific way of you being true to yourself, so to say. And if once you are true to yourself and... Um, that means you the, the shortest way to discover the divine value within yourself and in the world. Uh, if one doesn't follow that, follow somebody else's dharma, somebody else's way of being, then it is a longer way, as it were. <laughs> then we discover that it was wrong for us to act in that way. So slowly we fall back into our svadharma, <laughs> and then it becomes the easier path to discover the divine. Mm. There are so many ways in which we can really look for it. Yes, yes, Radhe. Oh, I was just going to say, maybe we could also think of it as Swadharma, as our outer actions being aligned with our inner truth, our, our Swabhava, the, the, the inner truth, who we are, uh, the purpose of, of why our soul incarnated. So it's that alignment of the inner and the outer. And oftentimes, like uh, Vladimir says, if we don't have that connection with the inner, then our activities in the outer world, our actions, our dharma is misaligned. And so not that there isn't learning that can take place and growth, but it's, it's not that, that perfect alignment that allows for the quickest uh, path. Right, and the truth being the truest in us to 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 establish that true connection with our activities. That swabhava is the the nature of our inner self, yes, which is the closest to the divine, which wanted to manifest in a particular fashion, in a particular way, in a particular reincarnation, yeah? and that has to be honored and what do you call it uh, valued and brought forward there is a way to recognize our true true need true bhava you know? true way of becoming here because we all are uniquely individualized so to say none of us has the same path we are all truly unique individuals this is something um, very typical for integral yoga and not so typical for other paths of yoga, <laughs> that we are all uh, absolutely unique individuals yeah, and have our own path to the divine. And that is the, 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 the vision of svadharma. You have better to follow your own dharma than... Uh, even if it is uh, viguna, as says, as Krishna says, we will read today, uh, void of qualities. Better to follow your own dharma, which is void of qualities, which is not so attractive, than to follow somebody else's dharma, which is uh, promising a lot, a lot of success. 
because it is a wrong path. You would not realize yourself through that. And this is the, the problem of today's world, actually, that we are offered some kind of framework or some kind of paradigm of success, how to become successful being in this society, which is not fitting for many people. And they are all losing their track and their path. They become unhappy, successful businessmen or something, you know. Unhappy because finally they didn't realize that for what they came to realize. There was one, uh, uh, one uh, great wise person who was growing cabbage. It is in the Greek mythology. <laughs> and some, some people came from the king and said, the king knows that you are very wise and wants you to become his, uh, you know, counselor or something. Uh, advisor and come back from the village to the palace and live in the palace and he said yes see, that was the roman emperor diocletian yes <laughs> and he said you know look what cabbage i grew <laughs> what a beautiful huge cabbage he's frozen maybe you can tell the story in a shot <laughs> you know oh. i think is it internet just oh yeah he's frozen uh, i was uh, very successful he even came up with the rationalistic religion for Rome before Christianity took over. And at the end of his life, he left Rome, the Senate, the Congress, everything. He just went away to what is now Croatia, started growing um, cabbage and cauliflower and tomatoes. And nothing could get him away from Croatia back to the halls of power in Rome. And when they questioned him why, he said, I'd rather be growing cabbage than listening to all the senators and like all these people talk and give lectures in Rome. And he actually did live to a long, ripe life. He, I think he lived until he was 76 or 77 before he died. And then uh, it was uh, the fall of Rome. <laughs> <laughs> Nice, thank you, Vlad Vladimir. We just Nishat just stepped in while we lost you there, so he, he was yeah, sharing the I story heard, you reported. I heard, yes, right, lovely, <laughs> very nice. Thank you, Nishat. Yes. Oh, um, no problem. <laughs> for catching up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about the Roman history. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, well. So, what exactly would be the uh, way to recognize one's true path? Because many times, even in one's path, one might to be faced with paths, other paths that is not in alignment so much or that one finds resistance to. So how, especially when one finds resistance to something, how does one know that that's the true thing? Like for example, just um, like suppose a creative part person, an artist, like suppose he wants, he's like exploring himself and he's doing very much artistic works, but he probably doesn't have much aptitude for business, but in order to promote his art to the world, he has to do those business kind of things also. So how does one know like uh, where to stop, how to proceed, like those true paths and true needs? Yeah, it's a big question actually. One has to be sincere and honest enough with oneself really and not to be afraid and not to be easily influenced by opinions of others. Something in us knows, and actually the definition which Krishna gives in the Gita is quite interesting. Better to follow one's own path than uh, even void of qualities than the path of the others which offers a lot of success. Because when you follow, I am looking for that quotation, I think it was in the previous. Mm -hmm. Because uh, following the success, oh here it is, Shreyan Svadharmo Vigunach, it's over two shlokas. Paradharmat Svanusht Hitat. Svadharme nidhanam shreyach, because in one's own dharma, even the dissolution, death, is shreyas, is best, is the best. Paradharmo bhayavahach, but the dharma of the other, which is not yours, brings fear. Now this fear is something which is 
Unfortunately, Sri Aurobindo did not translate these shlokas, so you don't see this translation. So you have to trust me in this case. So Bahaya Vahach brings fear, um, the dharma of the other. And that is the indication. If we are very careful, it is a psychological indication. The moment we decide something to do and we feel uncomfortable, or oh, there is some kind of fear that you are stepping not into your shoes, as it were, mm. then you should be very conscious about it and try to avoid that path or become aware at least of it, what you are doing, that it is temporarily kind of challenge for you, that it is not you now. You will be doing something which is not you. We all have this experience. We know it exactly in the moment we make wrong decisions. We get that sense of oh, what is going on with my life? Where am I heading at? Yeah. And then something in us, some mind, some desires, some you know, other friends, people telling us how good it will be. Look at the benefits of this and that which is coming with this. And we slowly fall into it. And then they, later we realize how, how wrong we were in that moment. You know, you know, uh, this reminds me of Vladimir. Often at, at one point um, we were, you know, thinking about this question, how, how do you know? How do you kind of connect and find your swabhava and therefore the right action um, in the outer world? And we were, we were thinking that if you kind of consider when you were very young, uh, before you had a lot of outside influences, maybe you were five, six, eight, mm -hmm what have you, if you think back then of if there was a particular yearning or you were drawn to a particular area in life that oftentimes that will give you some indication because you haven't had kind of all this, this outer uh, influence, although you've at least you know been in the educational system, so you have some, but you were still pretty raw and open and connected uh, to that, that inner self. So, so that's one way, actually, I, I don't know if you remember Vladimir, but you and I sat and, and tried to go through that exercise and recall back when, um, and, and another thing that I, I've heard, um, which I think is true is oftentimes people will say, well, you were just influenced by your parents. Your, your father's a doctor, your writer's a mother. So you're a doctor who does writing. That's not really your path. That's their path. But sometimes the soul will actually choose those parents in mm -hmm. that environment that it is here to learn from and grow into, and it, and, and it is part of its swadharma. So you, you know, I think it's wrong to just automatically exclude if you find yourself in, in the same kind of uh, area as parents or even grandparents. Um, that can, in fact, be the way that the the soul chose to uh, kind of uh, find its 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 swadhamra and have it come out earlier, uh, if mm -hmm. you will. So absolutely, it is not a, uh, defined by uh, outer kind of correspondence. It is by only inner needs of the soul. So if you need to be the writer and your father happened to be the writer, it's fine. So it has nothing to do with uh, who is around and what they are doing. It's your need, first of all, of what you want to be. And sometimes we also misinterpret these things easily because um, the outer activities are only the activities, you know. Uh, and the needs of the development of the Svabhava to realize our, ourselves in the world, we take any activity to, to use it for that swabhava to be realized, you know. So it's not necessarily that there has to be a total match between the, the outer action and profession and your inner needs. Absolutely not. Uh, you, you have a need of some kind which can be realized in any profession. And that makes you a unique mm -hmm. uh, representative of that need in that particular profession. <laughs> so uh, that's why we have so many different teachers. Yeah, they are not the same. Um, 
they have all different needs in their self-development and uh, so many different uh, prof in one profession so many different workers of different quality and different kind because they are looking for different realization of their inner svabhava there is no total match and never will be but if there is something closer to your needs the outer professional outer involvement is better matching with your needs then you are very lucky because then your life flows seamlessly so to say you are you don't even notice that something is going on you are so at ease uh, you don't even feel that you do something, that you work hard. Working hard is the first indication that something is wrong with your alignment. <laughs> <laughs> so when we talk about karma yoga and we talk about liberation from the, the actor himself or herself, isn't that also what we're talking about here with sacrifice? Absolutely. That liberation from the sense of you, that you are the worker, that you are responsible, that you do a lot, that you did a lot. You remember every suffering you went through, you know, and you already put a lot of medals and on yourself that you're so great, you earned your... <laughs> pension <laughs> you earned it <laughs> with your blood and sweat <laughs> of course that means uh, you didn't follow your swabhava you followed something else mm. you didn't have that alignment otherwise you lived your life as a free being you don't even remember what you really did everything happened to be true to you you don't have that kind of labor. Labor is a heavy business. It's a curse of labor. I'm mentioning this once in a while to Radha. This idea of the curse of labor in the Bible is actually coming from there. That you will be not aligned with your inner being. And you would feel heaviness of labor and involvement in this manifestation. But the moment you are aligned, you don't have it. The, the work then become, becomes a blessing, not a curse. We all feel this curse of labor. You know? we, we, kind of, we were imposed with this religion on ourselves that labor is heavy, it's difficult, it has to be avoided. You have to find them the means how to manage it in such a way that to give less and to get more. And then you are a successful businessman. You put 30% in and you got 1,000 out. You are very successful. That's, that's the idea of this, uh, of this thinking. And the, the true ideal is um, you give 100% in and live 100% out. There is no more measurement. There is no more selling and buying. There is no bargaining here. There is a growth, constant growth of consciousness. Well, this is my thoughts. I'm sorry, I just it's not in the Gita. But I believe that there will be a time when this idea of managing and generating more by doing less is um, going to be uh, viewed as inferior to that absolute giving in and absolute getting out of the world. Hmm one day in the future <laughs> when we are spiritual beings but not now of course now there's much to do still um great great thoughts thank you for sharing thank you Radha. um there is somewhere thank Zik you both for your insights yes there is Siegfried there i would love to hear his thoughts because he was doing as he wrote such a beautiful paper just in this moment i was thinking about your last words and i'm making the the question in my head mm -hmm. is some of you uh, 
someone heard about Gesara. Do you know anything about Gesara? No. Gesara, maybe my pronunciation is not right. Gesara, Nesara and Gesara? No? It's okay. It's, it's from Sanskrit, you want to say? No, 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 no. no. It's an it's, uh, economic uh, concept uh, which uh. is coming in this period of time. And oh. so it's something about to... It's, it's the change of the economic system to avoid, to, to, to finish with the debt. Because mm. all our uh, system is... Um, yes. Attach the debt uh, and uh, enslave with the debts, yeah. all the countries, all the societies, families, business, everything. And it's something about to to re reinvent, redesign the economy without debt. Mm -hmm. And this is the concept of Gesara. And I, I was thinking because he was talking about <laughs> this kind of attitude in the in the change of the service and products without uh Bargain or something without a bargain, yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the in the Veda, we know these creatures, these uh, beings, which Bendo calls the the senses of action or karmendrias. These very karmendrias we mentioned Kar for karma yoga, they are also very important. They do not know how to sacrifice karmendrias because they grew up from the inconscient. And these are our hands, legs, yes, speech, procreatory and excretory organs. So these which interact with the outer world, they grew up from the, from the inconscient. And they do not know how to really allow the deeper inner consciousness be present when we are active outside, outwardly, when we walk, on, when we work, or when we talk, or when we procreate. Yeah? They do not know how to hold to the inner perception. So the moment we become active outwardly, we lose that connection with the inner. This is something very mm, specific to our nature. Yes? So the whole idea is to connect the outer karmendrias, the, the senses of action with jnanendrias. So if they are connected and they work together, and Jnanendrias are not driving them to the satisfaction of their own. Uh, they are no look, not looking through to satisfy their own senses through them, th uh, but allowing the inner spirit, inner connection to shine through. Then Karma Yoga is realized and sacrifice is done, basically. But um, these Karmendrias in the Veda are called Panis. It's quite interesting. Shabindu speaks about them. He says they are not the enemies actually, but they do not know how to really give themselves. Uh, they never did this. They grew up from the narrow consciousness, darker consciousness, which always tried to survive and to assert itself. So we inherited that particular consciousness from the lower subconscious levels and we behave in that way. All our talks about survival, about uh, sustainability is built basically on these um, insecure uh, karmendrias which always survived by self-assertion, not by self-giving. They do not know how to do it. And these panis he calls panis from root pan, to trade. They are traders, traffickers. They traffic and trade the information, the light, but they do not know the value of that light. They are constantly kind of asserting and aggrandizing themselves through this trade. They gain a particular power, as it were, through it, and look at the world, you will see it immediately, <laughs> everywhere in the world. <laughs> 
Well, and they're, they're hoarders too, right? So they hoard right. so much they more hoard. than anything that, that they would ever need or want to know the value of, and they hide it from everyone else. Yeah, they hide it in the subconscious cave, that cave of wonders. You remember Aladdin? That is the cave of wonders where all our spiritual insights, all our spiritual um experiences of a long period of time over billions of years are stored and held kept away from us and that has to be rediscovered by us it's it's a it's the vedic kind of vision uh, we are kind of tapping into a completely new system of uh, thought but actually the Indra, the Lord of the Divine Mind, with his lightning and Maruts, this, the Brahmins, warriors, they come and they destroy the Vala, the, the subconscious wall. Vala is wall, actually, the cave, and they, they release the herds of the sun the herds of the sun. They rediscover a new heaven, a new sun, a new dawn. Everything is rising. Rivers flow from there. Everything which was stored in the subconscious cave is now released and we are free. There is no more difference between the upper and lower. So there is no more difference between spirit and matter. The whole material uh, creation becomes a spiritual enterprise. Now, this is the Vedic myth, but um, it is very close to what we are trying to discuss in other terms here in Karma Yoga. How to become active and perceptive at the same time. How to act and be aware of the spirit at the same time. Not in meditation, not with closed eyes, not by stop thinking and breathing as, as it is now. Because to get into the inner perception, we have to stop outer activities. That's why we develop this, this methodology of yoga. We just look in the Yoga Sutras. It's all about that, how to stop every activity in order to, to, to have a chance to, to have a glimpse of the inner reality. Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha. We have to stop every activity of Chitta in order to get to the inner perception. But the moment we start acting outside, we cut off from the inner perception. That's what uh, Pavita was talking to Sri Aurobindo and asking his advice what to do. He said, when I am in meditation, I feel the presence. It is so wonderful. It's pressure from above, force descends. But the moment I am engaged in some activity, I start to, I try to solve some equation. He was a mathematician. He was very interested in mathematics. My mind runs towards this equation and I'm losing the, the presence. So how to keep both? how to have a presence and be active in outer life. This is the fundamental question of our existence. How not to fall into the meditative state only and then coming out of the meditative state become ordinary again. That's what we see in our lives. Don't we see this? So he tells him, you go slow, he says. Don't do activities which are disconnecting you from the perception of the spirit. Train yourself to keep the connection and do the activities outside. This is our major training. There are other ways of doing it. This is one of the ways which Sri Aurobindo suggested to Pavitra. Yes, Siegfried. Thank you, Radir. Um, if, if I try to practice what you are saying, um, I, I, can, I can experience like I, I can be a witness of uh, my sensorial consciousness if I have my eyes open or I 
pay attention in my what I'm hearing. But even if I'm going to inside, um, I can still be uh, witnessing and not focusing any sensorial conscious consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in what I want to say is is like a um, is like a process of uh, selective attention. The witness can choose in what you can you want to f focus in your in your attention. Yes. Right? Oh, you just let it to that focus of drive, whatever it does. Uh, the Prakriti does its work, and you just observe what is happening, really. D you should not resist what it uh, does, but you should not also uh, kind of refocus it and do it as you will, because then immediately you lose that, or not immediately, but gradually you lose the connection with the witness. Yeah. Mm. But there is another another point. Uh, in In... In some states, you 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 lose your this kind of power of selective attention, and then you become like a receptor. It's like you leave you yourself to be surprised of what is coming from anywhere inside, maybe. But it's like you change your your pose. And you stop to be uh, so a witness of what you are conscious of, sensorial or cognitive conscious, and then you switch off this, and you start to be in a receptor state, like a radio radio uh, receptor. And in in that case, what is coming is more abstract and is more. Uh, and, surprise to you. Yeah. And it, it, this yeah. is what you are talking about now. It is in a way, uh, if you describe it from the point of view of the Indriyas, which perceive, yes, then uh, of course. But there is something else within us, that witness, which has its own source or its own consciousness, as it were. And then whatever Indriyas perceive from outside the world, whatever they bring in, is no more so much surprising because the whole surprise is within you because the surprise is the whole thing the smallest thing is a big surprise you know, the same big surprise as the big thing there is no difference between the big and the small anymore because they, you have another source within you or another motivator or another presence which which is it, and we are sp speaking about the beginning of the path if it develops and that consciousness grows in us and takes charge of everything we do starts sanctioning the movements of prakriti and we become aware of it this is a second stage which leads to the final stage where where there is total unity between Ishvara and Shakti. So there is no more Purusha and Prakriti division. There is oneness of Ishvara and Shakti. So everything you lived outside is the spiritual presence of the inner being. There is no more di distinction between the outer and inner. But that is the, the aim. Uh, on, before that, there will be many stages, many surprises, many discoveries, many tunings, which will take place until it is done. And I think we have, we only this we have to do here. There is nothing else for us to do in this world. It's this, to allow the inner consciousness to, to shine through, to come to the surface and to occupy the outer activities. Though we think we are here to do something outside, <laughs> but uh, it is not really so. And uh, Sri Krishna would say, oh, Sarvam karma kilam partha jnane parisamapyate. All the karma without remainder, all the activities are only for one reason to gain that self realization, to gain that consciousness. These are the means not the aim. 
well, um, till that moment, of course, we believe that we are here something to do, something is to be done, and we are very proud of what we did. We think that we did it, <laughs> though it was Prakriti who did it through us as a means. We are the means for her doing. Uh, well, uh, that's the teaching of the Gita, of course, and it's very beautiful. Okay, shall I read a few uh, shlokas that we will finish today this chapter? What do you think? Or oh, there are more thoughts to share. I'm very glad that we are doing sharing because it is it is meant for this, actually, to share thoughts on the ground of what we are studying from the Gita. Okay, well, since nobody says anything, I will read. Um, we stopped at 35. Actually, this was our shloka, and it was interesting that you asked about Svadharma. Shreyan Svadharma Vigunach, but uh, your own dharma void of gunas qualities, paradharmat, than any other dharma, svanushthitat, well performed. Svadharma nidhanam shreyach, in one's own dharma, even death is the blessing, paradharmo bhayavah, and the dharma of the other brings fear. Now, fear is a particular word, bhayam, from root bhi. It means actually shrinking back to yourself. So when you realize that you are no more at home somewhere in some context, then you shrink back to yourself. So when you feel that shrinking, you know that that thing which is offered to you as for you is not yours. It's not for you. So you are falling back to yourself. You are afraid to expand in that direction. Arjuna uvacha Athakena prayukto yam papam charati purushaha Anichanna piparshneya baladivani yojitaha And Arjuna says Athakena prayukto yam papam charati purushaha And then by whom compelled this man falls into the sinful action? Anichanapi, as if he doesn't want O Varshneya or Krishna. Balad Ivan Yojitach, as if by force he is, he is assigned to do the wrong action. Shri Bhagavan Vacha, Kama Esha, Krodha Esha, Rajoguna Samudbhavaha, Mahashano Mahapapma, Vidhyenam Ihavairinam, Dhumena Vriyate Vahnir Yatha Darsho Malenacha, Yatholbena Vrita Garbhach Tatha, Tenedam avritam, avritam jnana me tena jnani nachnitya vairina, kama rupena kaunteya dushpurena nadena cha, indriani mano buddhir asyadhishthana mucchate, etair vimohayat yesha jnana mavritya dehinam. These are all without translation. I will translate in one go all of them. Tasmad tvam indriyan yadau niyam yabharatar shabha papmanam prajahi hienam jnana vijnana nashanam indriyani paran yahur indriye bhyav param manaha manasastu para buddhir yo buddhev paratastu saha evam buddhev param buddhva Samstabhyatmanam atmana jahishatrum mahabaho kamarupam durasadam Om Tat Sat So this is the end of the third chapter. I will translate all of these shlokas in one go. So who is that? then asks Arjuna. Who assigns us or forces us as if by force to do the wrong action? And the answer is Kama Esha. This is the desire. 
Krodhaesha, this is the anger. Rajoguna Samudbhavach, which was born from Rajas Guna in nature. Mahashanach, Mahapapma, it is uh, with a lot of expectation and or Mahapapma, uh, uh, very sinful. Vidhi enam ihavairinam, know it here as the enemy. As if the fire is covered by smoke. As the um, mirror is covered by dust. As if the garbha, the embryo, is covered by ulba, by the uh, shirt, when we are born in the shirt. Tatha <laughs> tena. Idam avritam. Thus, it is covered by this karma and kroda. Everything here which is true is covered by, by the desire and anger. We will come to this desire more. We will discuss what it, what is this desire for Krishna. Avritam jnanam etena. And the self-realization and knowledge are covered by it. Jnaninach of the one who is a knower. Nityavairina by the constant enemy. Kama Rupena by the in the form of Kama Kaunteya or Arjuna. Dushpurena difficult to feel Analenacha by the by the fire which is difficult to satiate. And that is the idea that desire cannot be satiated, cannot be satisfied. Yeah. I was mentioning this already many times. Uh, even the rain of golden coins cannot satisfy the desire <laughs> because it is not here to be satisfied. It, it has totally different nature. Indriyani mano buddhir. Indriyas, mind, manas, and buddhi, asya adhishthana mucchyate, is the foundation for the karma. Etair vimoha yatyesha. By them he is bewildered. Jnana mavrita dehinam. Having covered the, the realization of the embodied one. Tasmat tvam indriyan yado niyam yabharatar shabha. Therefore, first you have to control your senses, indriyas, or best of bharatas. Papmanam prajahi hienam, kill or destroy this sin, sinful one, karma. Jnana vijnana nashanam, which destroys your knowledge and discernment. There's something in us which destroys our knowledge and discernment constantly, and that is the krodha and the karma of Rajas Guna. Indriyani paran yahuh, Indriyas are higher, they say. Indriyabhyav param manaha, higher than Indriyas are manas. Manasas tu para buddhih, this is typical Sankhya. Yeah? And beyond sense mind there is reason, or pure reason, buddhih, higher mind. Yo buddhih paratastu saha, and the one who is beyond buddhi is he. Evam buddhev param buddhva, and thus uh, having thought or having become aware of the one who is beyond buddhi, the purusha, samstabhyatmanam atmana, and established, having established oneself by oneself, jahi shatram, strike the enemy, mahabaho, or. Um, Powerful in in uh, mighty handed Kama Rupam, the form of desire, Durasadam, difficult to realize. This is the end of the third chapter. Very concrete suggestion to Arjuna, because Arjuna is the Kshatriya, the warrior. He can do it. It's not for everyone to strike the Kama. <laughs> 
when we strike karma, it strikes back. <laughs> so, and we usually lose the battle very easily. <laughs> but maybe it is for Arjuna, for the Kshatriya. But before he can strike the uh, karma, he has to establish himself beyond buddhi. He has to find the unborn self within himself and establish his all being on the ground of that unborn self. And only then he can get rid of, of the influence of the desire. Okay, uh, it's not very... Mm, Oh, you, I see your faces, they are not very happy from this suggestion. <laughs> so I wanted to ask, like, is there any relation between like, when this karma, the desire and everything forces a person towards bad actions, like anger and everything, there might be something like, as in, even in this case of Kurukshetra, like without Duryodhana's evil action or his anger and jealousy and without his betrayal, so this Kurukshetra and the Gita wouldn't have happened. So is there anything related to Swadharma or the action of some other force that's bringing this play or dynamic into in order to rain, bring the reign of divinity or something like that yeah the complexity is so huge you can see how many different dharmas vadharmas are interacting how many mistakes misunderstandings uh, deviations are interwoven into this tapestry of events that's the whole yes. mahabharata you can yeah. see how complex it is and how in that complexity you can really do the right action it's a big question yeah um better to follow one's own dharma <laughs> that is the right action so was duryodhana following his own swadharma when he was going through all these treacheries and anger and betrayal and banishing them from the kingdom was he really following his own swadharma like like uh, have, have you seen this? Uh, there is a new film which is very interesting. The, uh, it is called Dharma Kshetra or something. And um, it's on Netflix. Oh, you please find it. It is in Hindi, but it is with English subtitles. It's amazing. And you will find that all of them are coming in heaven. It's after everything already finished all the battles and they are all in heaven Duryodhana is there and Arjuna and everyone <laughs> they are sitting and they are being judged by the judge by the heavenly judge and they tell their stories <laughs> and Duryodhana says actually there that truly speaking he followed totally his Swadharma and that's why he went to heaven he believed that this is the way to do it to rule the kingdom. He was taught like this. He was giving knowledge in this way. Yes, that was called politics. He had to do this, had to do that. He had to assert himself. He was very proud of it. But he never betrayed his friends as others did. He accepted Karna. He became totally self-giving to the, his friends. He was very dharmic in his ruling. <laughs> so if you start looking at it from another perspective of the dynamics of the individuals, you will find some interesting picture, which is much more complex that we can perceive. We cannot judge everyone from our point of view only because there is a bigger complexity to be fulfilled. So I'm just suggesting uh, us not to answer hastily who is right and who is wrong. <laughs> and uh, who, why Arjuna and all other Pandavas except Yudhishthira went to hell and not to heaven? <laughs> it's another question. <laughs> there are many questions in Mahabharata which cannot be answered in one way. And you have a question from Anna, too, speaking of questions. She wants to know if you can repeat the uh, Netflix movie. I don't know if you remember. Ah, Dharma Kshetra. Dharma Kshetra. Yeah, I will, I will send you the, the link. It is interesting to watch. Really, you will learn a lot of stuff. Psychological. It is all psychological. Who, who thought what, felt what, and why he behaved in that or this way.
Yeah, they have 26 uh, episodes. I think we watched all of them. Yeah, this is amazing. <laughs> kind of mind boggling. Yeah. Mm. Would love to watch. Like, thank you. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Can, can I ask about the the word karma? Karma. Karma is from root come to desire. By the way, this word is loaded with many meanings. In the post-Vedic tradition, it becomes more and more sexual desire. And Kama is the lord of love, the god of love, actually. Cupid, yeah? the one who brings the, the sexual desire when, when somebody falls in love, as it were, uh, later, but not before. Uh, in, uh, in the Veda, Kama is a very positive term which means an intention or desire to manifest. But there, there is no yet separation on matter and manifestation. The manifestation is seen in terms of, of the spiritual enterprise, yes, more. So karma is the, that seed of desire to, to be something or to become something. The intention, the will to be is karma. And it is true in a way, if even in the sexual desire, which is kind of lower level of the same will to be, to become something. Yes. Mm. And this this power is coming from the the object or from the or from the. Um, the it comes from within. Yes. From within. Mm -hmm. It's an impulse to. To, which is pushing you out, what, she, uh, what um, Amal Kiran describes in this book, Light and uh, Delight, by the, what Mother explained. There's some force of love within us which pushes us out to interact with the world, to identify ourselves with the world, to give ourselves, to, to grab the world, to possess the world, because we want to identify ourselves with other selves as ourselves. We want to recognize ourselves in others. And we do it in many wrong ways because our consciousness is not wide and luminous enough. And that's what generates that karma which becomes the desire to possess, to, uh, to appropriate, to expand one's own egoistic being, as it were. And the, this kind of perception uh, from the karma is it, that doesn't have any any any. I don't know what's the word. It's not the problem. The 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 perception. The 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 problem is the the action. No, to to be the to problem. Be attach with that the problem is that it covers like uh, like the dust covers the the mirror or the smoke the fire it covers our self realization and discernment and then we become unaware of ourselves we are drawn to that particular passion of and then we lose ourselves that's the problem not the karma itself yeah, our because disconnection. When we connect with with this attitude, then we we most probably fall into the lap. Yeah, so right. Well, our perception is so narrow; it's so focused in that. Uh, yeah, attitude. No, that perception. Yes, but if you keep that wider perception, if you don't lose jnana and vijnana of yourself, yeah, knowledge and discernment, then karma is not a problem then you can act and live in the world with karma. Let, let, let it do its work. There's no problem. Well, then, then you, raise, you raise yourself above karmic retribution, ah. right? You're, you're above uh, the karma coming back. A different term of karma, but you, you, you don't have that karmic uh, result from your actions. Right. Right, that is, and that is karma yoga, basically. Karma yoga is about this, yeah? Not about stopping karma here, though he says here to destroy it as an enemy, and then to be free from it, and then act from another source, not from the source of desire, but from the motivation of the higher 
will in you or aspiration in you, which is there, but it is covered. You don't see it, you don't feel it in you because the karma takes, occupies the space you know, and drives you. So, but if you have the aspiration within, the light within, then karma does not take the, the charge of you and you are not bewildered. You just look at it with a smile as a, as a drive of nature. By the way, some uh, some tantrics we discussed this before. Just to maybe it's not the best uh, closure for for our meeting today, but some tantrics, um, Vama Marga tantrics, and uh, people misunderstand these tantrics that they they have these five M's. Yes, which we mentioned: Mithuna, Madhya, Matsya, Madhya, uh, Mi. Uh, this mansa, so meat, fish, madhya, the alcohol, and mithuna, the sex, all, they took all the activities which are prohibited for yoga and made them available as offering to the Divine Presence in them. They made the greatest, Sri Aurobindo describes this, he speaks on this, that it is usually misunderstood, but their life was very rigorous discipline, never to fall into the lap of that lower enjoyment. Take it and offer it to the higher light within them. <laughs> that is very difficult to do, most difficult. They did most daring offering. They took all the elements which are usually cast away from yoga, and offered them to the Divine, to the Higher Presence in them. If you can do it, there is no problem with karma. What yeah, it's like, it's like when you, when you are walking in, in, the, in the main street in the city, looking for, looking, uh, uh, yeah, looking the, the shops, the luxury shops, then you become so excited, excited, but you don't, you don't come, you don't go into the shop because then you, 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 can, you can be in bankrupt. But it's like this, no? You are walking in the street uh, with this kind of shining mm -hmm. uh, objects, then excite you and you become powerful without the temptation to go in and uh, lose yourself in the in the desire. Right. Or even um, um, which I was practicing when I came to um, to Norway from India, being in India 27 years, and then I came to here in Norway and I was admiring all those shops and products and quality and how people take care of, you know, shape and form and color and how they really sacrifice so much to this material existence to make it perfect, to make it shining, to make it beautiful beautiful, comfortable. One can admire it. One can find another level of appreciation within oneself, yeah? where the spiritual is not against the material. So we have to practice it constantly, not to be drawn to desire to have or to look better than we are. That The desire is a shortcut, actually, to what we have to become. And we are not growing in consciousness, we are making a shortcut. We address ourselves beautifully and we think we are beautiful. You know? We kind of present, we are constantly preoccupied with presentation of ourselves rather than being to what we truly are. Yeah? And that is the problem of desire. If it doesn't hijack us, it's fine. You can find the meaning in everything. It's a natural meaning. It has to continue. The, the creation has to continue. You can embrace it and love it as it is. Great. Thank you for these uh, questions and these ideas, Siegfried. All right, then I will close with mantra for today. Om 
सर्वे भवन्तु सुखिनः सर्वे सन्तो निरामया सर्वे भद्रा पश्यु मा कचि दुखभाग भवे ओ शाति 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 श्री गुरु भ्यो नम हरि ओ हरि ओम नमस्ते हरि ओम सी